Okay. So now let's talk about more detailed thermal analysis um, and what kind of tests you need to do to verify it. So we have this thermal modeling environment. And what I want to get across is the kind of information you need to know to do a thermal model, to create a thermal model. So here's a schematic and we're just gonna walk through it where databases are yellow. Databases are like orbit definition. So that's something you define. Your satellite geometry, which is the CAD and you also define that. And you also pick the physical material properties of the different components. Now your models are things that you also dictate, but they aren't um, per se, static values. Um, your attitude model, like we were talking about two days ago, it could be a spinner, it can be a three degree of freedom stabilized spacecraft. Um, then we have, what is a functional model? It takes library of physical material properties. So a functional model could be the way that you embody the material properties into the thermal model. Your thermal model is going to be actually calculating the amount of heat that is going through the different nodes. Um, and then your computations are gonna be, you know, tying together these library of databases, the models and the results. Where your orbit definition is going to you have to propagate your satellite's orbit and attitude, your satellite geometry. You're going to have to figure out the view factor. So we, remember, we are talking about um, how the Earth's albedo, the amount of heat transfer through Earth's albedo is dependent on view factor. So that would probably be a computational script that you put in the loop. And then um, thermal coupling is going to be something that stitches distinct components within the thermal model together, calculating the amount of heat that transfers. And then your results, what you ultimately want is your temperature over time. This model you'll see has a lot of arrows where there are nodes, but there are also loops. So, you only have to define the orbit once in the library of materials once, but then once you enter this loop, you go back and redefine as an iteration over time. So you'll calculate it for one time step, then you'll propagate through and then calculate again for the next time step. We have gone over finite element analysis before in the structures chapter. So I won't go into how finite element analyses works. Instead, I'll let you know how the different volume element elements interact with each other. So in the three directions, there's going to be some Q, or thermal energy that is entering on one side and exits the other side. Excuse me. Um, I hope you remember this equation for conduction. The Q coming in on this side, since it's touching a neighboring element, it's going to be governed by that thermal conductivity, the area of this surface that is touching and then the difference in temperature between that I minus one node and this I node, and then the difference in length, dance. The Q out is going to be the thermal conductivity, again, the same surface area. Um, and then the difference in temperature between the Ith node and the I plus one node, and then the DX as well. Um, and then remember, the solution to the time equation is going to be up here. 
there's that density and specific heat capacity, thermal conductivity. Um, and then we've got our temperatures at a time index of J plus one and J. So I wanna be very specific here. T is temperature, I is a space index. So I minus one, I node, I plus one. These parentheses, it's a function of time. You're looking at the distinction between the next time step, J plus one, and this time step, J, over some delta T, which is a difference in time between J plus one and J. Maybe I'm getting too specific, but I just wanna show you the fundamental equations of how temperature is calculated through space, which is down here, and through time, which is up here. Um, these simulation models, to make sure that they're accurate and the correct solutions don't diverge from the true solution, they limit the amount of time that is propagated forward to be less than you know, some ratio defined here. The concept I want you to get is the smaller the time step, uh, you want to limit your time step so that you are getting approximately close to the true solution every time you propagate forward in time. That's why you make time steps smaller. Okay. Um, to create these finite element analysis models, there are some analogs that we can make to thermal analysis and structural analysis. Um, and we also need to know the different loads that we can apply to finite element analysis for heat transfer. Um, okay, so taking our foundational knowledge from structural analysis, let's make an a relationship to what the analogous term would be in thermal analysis. So in structural analysis, instead of caring about displacements, we care about temperature change. Instead of uh, the gradient, which is the change being in strain, we're thinking about temperature gradients. Instead of stresses, we're thinking about heat flux. Instead of forces, we're thinking about heat sources. Instead of a prescribed displacement or some kind of boundary constraint, we're thinking about a temperature constraint. If you know for sure that this surface is gonna be at this temperature, that would be a constraint. Instead of force components, we're thinking about heat flow resultants. Instead of elastic modulus, we're thinking about thermal conductivity. Instead of Hooke's law, we're using Fourier's law. So we were talking about mechanisms of heat transfer that were conduction, convection, radiation. We apply these different mechanisms in different geometric entities. So con um, convection is going to act across a face. So is heat flux. Um, radiation is also going to act across a face. And I don't wanna go into the other one of these. For these different load types, you're going to need bulk temperature, film coefficient. We don't care about convection, so don't worry about that. Um, we're going to need to know for radiation surrounding temperature, emissivity value and view factor. Okay. Your result would look something like this. So here is a visualization of the temperature profile of the ISS distributed across space. Again, hotter nodes, red, cooler nodes, blue. What we know about the ISS is that the solar panels are very hot. They vary very widely depending on whether they're in direct sunlight or in eclipse. 
And we know that the habitation modules need to stay pretty cool. So that's why you see them in this lighter blue. And then we have these dark blue, which are the uh, radiators, I believe. So those you want to get pretty cold as a heat sink and then radiate away. Okay, so thermal design needs to be verified. The way that we verify it is through thermal vacuum testing, and there are a suite of tests. So here I have listed, there's the thermal cycling test, thermal vacuum test, the thermal balance test, and a vacuum bake-out test. And all of these tests have different um, specific goals in mind. So the thermal cycle test is generally executed in ambient pressure through the use of environmental chambers. This test is usually executed to a subsystem or system level. The test article, so what you put in the chamber, will be exposed to a series of cycles of hot and cold temperatures. The thermal cycling generates an environmental stress in the test article that allows to identify material and workmanship defects. The thermal vacuum test is a type of test to submit the specimen to a series of cycles of hot and cold temperatures in a high vacuum environment. Space simulation chambers are used to perform this type of test. During the development of TVT, functional tests for the performance verification of the subsystem or system are performed. Thermal balance tests are where space simulation chambers are used to demonstrate the performance of the thermal control system to maintain the temperatures within the operational limits. This test is necessary to verify the performance of the spacecraft of thermal design when it is exposed to the thermal environment conditions. This test is also used to measure the thermal deformations in the system. Then finally, the vacuum bakeout test. The spacecraft is exposed to high temperature in a high vacuum environment during a determined time to simulate their outgassing. This test is executed to subsystem or system levels. Space simulation chambers are used to perform this type of test. Okay. Um, right, there are two components to a thermal vacuum chamber. There is the thermal control of the environment, and then there's also the pressure control of the thermal vacuum chamber. So how do we achieve vacuum? We achieve vacuum. Um, we're trying to get to at least a high vacuum, but to do that, we can't just use one pump because a pump doesn't work from rough vacuum all the way to high vacuum, for example, unless you're one of these. Um, sometimes you need a series of pumps to pump your volume down from a rough vacuum to a medium vacuum. And then you turn on your um, more refined vacuums like a turbo molecular pump once you get to a certain pressure. To achieve thermal profiles, a thermal vacuum chamber will utilize a series of different things. So, although you see the thermal vacuum chamber, there are a lot of peripheral elements to make the environment inside more reflective of space. We can use a, um, okay, let's get the pumps out of the way. So there are the pumps to make the vacuum happen. You can see there's a rotary pump and a cryo pump. Um, and there's that vacuum gauge to measure the pressure. But let's talk about these components here. There is liquid nitrogen that will make the temperature of the outside or you know, certain fixed plates very, very cold. And then there is also a heater, typically um, mounted to some, the heater is some lamp or it could be a hot plate that the spacecraft is mounted to. Um, what do I want to say? Inside, you'll see that there is a black surface. So we call this like a, a black shroud. 
radiative heat transfer is achieved by covering the chamber's inner surfaces with that black shroud to mimic black body radiation. This shroud can be cooled to cryogenic temperatures to stimulate the ambient temperature of space. To get to cryogenic temperatures, that's where the liquid nitrogen comes in. Um, and then certain surfaces can be heated or thermal lamps can be situated to simulate the radiation from the sun or other, other planetary bodies. Question here. Presumably the test chamber is insulated with some material protect, to protect the outside from extreme temperatures. Why not try to find a cheaper, lighter, or just improve whatever this material is instead of designing and testing new components or materials? Um, I don't think I understand this question very well. So I will answer the part I do understand. The test chamber is insulated with some material. Yes, I guess it is insulated with some material, but do remember that vacuums are insulative. So if the shroud is displaced from the surface of this chamber, then the amount of space separating the shroud from the actual thermal vacuum chamber is going to be quite insulated. Um, so you don't need to worry about the outside getting too cold. Mm. If whoever typed that question can put it in the chat in a more descriptive way to help me understand it, maybe I can answer it in this lecture. Otherwise, I'm gonna move on. Okay, so once the spacecraft is within the thermal vacuum chamber and it's pumped down um, and it's being subjected to different thermal profiles, the spacecraft will undergo outgassing, thermal expansion, thermal cycling, and realistic heat transfer. So here you'll see just a, a cross-sectional area of how the spacecraft would be mounted inside of a thermal vacuum chamber. We've got the spacecraft, um, and there's these little squiggly lines are radiation that, are, that is being imparted to the spacecraft, but also could be emitted outward. Uh, and that's from this low reflectivity and high emissivity shroud. We also have something called a thermally controlled platen plate um, that can be the cold or the hot plate that this like one face of the spacecraft interacts with. So a question is, outgassing, isn't this something that you want to prevent from happening? Yes, it is something you want to prevent from happening. Um, you want to pick materials that have low outgassing, theoretically. But all materials to some point will have some diffusion or vaporization or desorption after undergoing vacuum for the first time. Because they're being manufactured on ground, the composition is going to be different than it is in space. So you want to do this vacuum bake out um, to get this like initial outgassing out of the way so that when you do send it to space that you, know, you don't have to do that first outgassing in space when you're in a critical mission operations scenario. Mm, I don't know if I wanna go into this picture, but this is a picture that shows mechanisms contributing to outgassing. Pretty much there's a bulk material and there are molecules that will diffuse or vaporize or go through desorption. It could also be that there are materials on the other side that permeate through this material. Um, outgassing can be bad for the thermal vacuum chamber if like chunks come out and like go through the pumps. That's no good. Okay, so that's the end of lecture.